Welcome to the Inovia Consulting Webinar Series On Demand. Scan the QR code or visit anovia.com forward slash resources to check out the latest Business Central news and training for your business. This session is powered by UST Education. UST Education provides over 200 webinars a year for associations and B2B clients. The webinars are always led by thought leaders and offer CD credits. Um, before I tell you a story, I am going to just introduce you guys to Rocky. He's eight weeks old. He is biting me a lot. So if um, I seem distracted, it's because I'm being bitten. Um, he's very cute, but very bitey. So I'm going to put him down now and hope for the best for my feet. All right. In the meantime, a story time. So this is just a little backstory so you can get to know me and that I am funny. Um, I was accounting manager for a fairly small company and I got a job interview for a controller and he had asked me if I knew anything about sales tax, which the proper answer was probably no, because they don't teach you sales tax literally anywhere. Right. So like how, if you're going to learn it, you have to learn it because somewhere you work probably had it, but it's not CPA exams. It's not taught in accounting courses. Mostly because it also changes like day to day, right? So it's a very hard topic to stay up on. And, but I had gotten a call when I was an accounting manager from the state of Florida asking if I was Nexus there. And I did a bunch of research and I determined I was not because our goods were driven into Florida and then left immediately from Florida, which made it not Nexus. So I told him that for some reason that was good enough and I got the job, right? And then all of a sudden I had to learn a lot about sales tax through a fire hose because they had just got audited by the state of California and now all of a sudden had a huge nexus ordeal and they had to file for nexus in a bunch of states and implement an attack software and uh, that's where I came in and I didn't know anything about sales tax so that was pretty funny so I'm not saying I lied I'm just saying that I may have embellished a little bit that too serious phone call but it has filed by career now to where I am today to actually talk about sales tax for real and not just a, um, yeah, sure. I took a phone call once about this topic, which brings you to me. I'm Andrea. I am an MBA and a CPA. I used to be a former controller um, before I turned to what they call the dark side as a consultant. And what I do all day, every day is implement Business Central. And I specialize in a few different things, um, one of them being sales and use tax. Um, I'm also the Denver user group chapter leader. So if you um, are interested, you should definitely check out to see if you have a local user group that's active because it's fun and it's free and the people who run them put in a lot of work. So it's really cool if people actually come up. I'm also an all-star winner. I know some people are at Summit this week, so they not joining us and that's um, where my award came from. And not to brag, but I am second place in my age category at my local gym for bench squat and deadlift. So pretty big deal right there. All right, I am gonna stop being on camera. Um, that way I can look all around if I can figure out how to stop the camera really quick, maybe. Um, and then we'll dive right into it. We have a lot of ground to cover. Um, so I am gonna talk really fast so we can get through as much content as possible. If you have any questions, just pop it into the chat and I will try to slow down and look at it. We are going to do a few demos, hopefully that time allows. Um, I will always just warn people, sometimes with demos, things go weird. So don't judge me on that alone. All right. Next slide. So our I guess, second CPE question. But first one I'm going to ask you, are you guys on NAV or BC or using an outside software currently for sales tax? You got a NAV, all right. Julie's just doing it for the credit. <laughs> BC and Avalara, yeah, Avalara. Nice. All right. Oh, heal for credit. I've misread that. All right. 
So just in case there's a difference between sales and use tax, since this is a two-part series, and I know we're not going to talk about use tax today, but sales tax is imposed on retail transactions, right? It applies to all retail sales of tangible personal property, and in some cases, services in a state that you're an accident, which we will talk about what an is in a second here. Use tax is imposed on yourself when you purchase tangible personal property that didn't have sales tax on it, right? Or you consume your products. In the next series, we're going to talk more about what use tax is and is it. Um, and then in that series, you'll also figure out if you should have sales tax imposed on you or not based on the use tax being imposed or not. So we're here today to discuss more how you are going to impose sales tax on people and less on if sales tax should be imposed on you. All right. So the current sales tax environment. So just in case you don't know what Nexus is, Nexus is a legal term that refers to if you should basically be collecting and remitting sales tax in that state. So if you hear somebody say, are you Nexus there? you're probably registered in that state too, right? Like you can't just say, oh, I'm supposed to collect tax. You must register to pay the tax to the state. All right, and when might one have nexus? So the traditional laws are called the quill laws and those are physical presence. This was a lot easier back in the day before the internet, right? Were you physically located there? And then the answer was yes, you were nexus there, right? Do you have like salespeople working there? Do you have a large warehouse there? Do you have consigned inventory? It even became somewhat of like, hey, did you attend a trade show there? And before you freak out about trade show attendance or having a booth on a trade show, know that bigger states that are common for um, trade shows, like think Las Vegas, um, they typically do not have that in their nexus laws because the fun thing about nexus laws is they're state specific. They can even be county, um, municipality, uh, parish specific. Like they don't have, they're not regulated by the federal government. Therefore, they could all be very different, which is what makes that trade show one a little bit of a hmm, right? Um, it could even be like you have a van that delivers your products, um, can make you nexus. So good examples of those is going to be like New York and New Jersey. If you drive across the border in your company truck from New York to New Jersey, I have bad news. You have nexus. And then in fact, the auditors used to actually sit outside um, of New York and wait for the trucks to pass and then check to make sure every truck's logo was actually registered in the state of New Jersey. So that is the fun trick there. Sometimes it's just sales advertising as well. So like if you advertise a lot into one state, commercials, mail fly or something like that, that could trigger nexus. And then revenue thresholds. There was old revenue thresholds, but these days when somebody talks about revenue thresholds, they're talking about the next slide, which is Wafer versus South Dakota, which is the economic nexus. And this is really what's getting a lot of people now wrapped up into sales tax is this Wayfair laws because this went from basically being a fairly minor um, thing where the, like maybe a few states had economic thresholds. Now a lot of them have it. And don't forget, this is in addition to physical presence. So physical presence isn't gone, but now you have this economic nexus and oftentimes these are pretty low. This is $100,000 into any state. And we're gonna talk more in another slide about what that $100,000 could consist of. There is some states that still have the 100 to 200 transaction rules, but a lot of times this has been deemed, um, I don't know if the illegal is the word to use, but almost overkill because if you run a small shop on Etsy and you're selling a $10 item, but you sold 200 times, now you've triggered Nexus, your cost of compliance is higher than probably the revenue you're actually making on these 200 transactions. So there has been some pushback on these 100 to 200, and a lot of those have been removed from the books, but the economics themselves 
um, uh, has not gone away, right? You, we're now seeing more and more states getting it, right? You can even see cities getting in on it, like Chicago doing a 100K software download. Kind of used to be that software, especially downloaded software, really wasn't a Nexus creating event. It, it definitely wasn't a sales tax event. And now you're seeing states like, or cities like Chicago getting in on the action, saying, wait, a lot of software downloads happen. We should be getting money on that because if there's one thing the government wants, it's money. So any way to get it, they're going to go for it, right? And there's even other things like the non-collector sellers use tax reporting, which I'll talk about on another slide too, a little bit more in depth. This one is kind of a gotcha for anyone who has not seen that before because it actually has pretty big financial implications. And then we're seeing other things just propping up in the sales tax regulations, um, like gross receipts on digital advertising in Maryland, Alaska, which is one of our nomad states that do not charge sales tax. You're now starting to see a 1.76 tax rate, at least at the time when I wrote this, it was 1.76. As I said, it could change. So don't quote me on rates. Um, but you're starting to see this, and it's because of alternate energy source and COVID. Um, Alaska finally had to start charging some tax. And then Colorado has this weird delivery fee of 27 cents, which I will be honest, besides just adding a line to Colorado invoices for 27 cents, I really haven't figured out how to put this on. Um at least it's not very easy. It's not like an Avalara or something. You can just be like, I need this 27 cents. So that is a fun one. Colorado is fun overall. Um, so I will mention that. So here's our current economic nexus. So these are people that have economic nexus laws, which is at 100000 maybe $200,000 as a minimum threshold to qualify as nexus in the state. And if you're wondering, it is a trick in every state, but the nomad states, right? Fun. Um, so pretty much at this rate, if you do business in any state, you most likely are actually nexus in that state. Um, yeah, okay. Well, to, we got another slide coming up about that. So then what is that non-collector seller's use tax reporting? So basically what that is, is they had found that most people are not remitting um, use tax, right? So when you are subject to sales tax. Now, this was a much bigger deal, like let's say with Amazon, before Amazon did marketplace taxations. But they basically said most states were losing out on about $7.5 million in state sales tax not being collected. Um, because they suggest that basically about 2% of people are actually doing use tax. But now Colorado had instituted a law that basically said that you need to notify people that you're not charging them sales tax. And then you should notify the state of Colorado that you didn't charge sales tax on these these like transactions. And if you didn't do all this, it was $5 penalty per transaction not reported. And that's why I was like, this is impossible to comply with. So in a way, it almost makes you have to be nexus in the state of Colorado to even slightly comply with this law. Now, did Colorado get sued for this law? Has other states been sued for these laws because they're super steep? And, you know, it's a pretty significant margin, absolutely. Are they still on the books? Yes. Can you be audited and possibly fined? Definitely. Is it probably the one thing that I would take away from this webinar? Probably not. Like I'm not saying panic and go file for um, your tax, sales tax in Colorado, but it's definitely one of those things that most people just don't know about. It's not like they released it and it made national headlines and everybody immediately did this thing that Colorado was asking them to do. All right, that brings us to marketplaces. So that's your Amazon, your Ebays, your Facebooks, and your Instagrams. Um, so realistically, 
those now charge tax. It used to be back in the day, they didn't, or you had to have some kind of connector for your Amazon. So that would charge tax. But oftentimes you still have to um, report these sales, right? Um, while the marketplace will calculate and collect the appropriate sales tax amount, they won't remit to the state. So you're not collecting and remitting it. They're doing it. But do these actually count as a basis for your economic nexus? So it really depends on type of Amazon sell too. Like if you sell it to Amazon versus you shipping um, and having it listed on Amazon, it could make a dependency on if you've met that $100,000 rule or not, right? So if you're calculating all your sales into a state, do you have to calculate all your Amazon ones in the state? So it is different state by state. You do got to watch out for that because you do actually have to report it. Here's a map, right? Um, so we got our nomads in there, economic. But this one says most states, U.S. states, include in marketplace sales and economic thresholds. So the blues are, is the blues or is the whites? I took out the key, which is funny enough. Um, I think it's the white ones are ones where you must include your um, marketplace into your sales to count as economic nexus. Like when I take out keys. All right. Uh, let's see what's the most important. I'm just trying to make sure we actually have time to get into the good stuff and not just thinking on this. But there are states, um, if you are worried about that, check out. Um, information about it. There's a link for you guys on it um, where you can see if the marketplace facilitator law counts for your transactions or your limits because um, you might end up having to file with the state where all your sales are on Amazon and you're basically doing a $0 return. All right. And then the number one question, oh, well, actually, the number one question I get about economic nexus and the hundred thousand dollars is, does it matter that it is B to B, right? They're all exempt, and the answer normally is no. It does not matter if your statewide gross receipts are a hundred thousand dollars or more, exempt or not. You do need to file in that state. So it is not if it is D to C or B to B. It is. $100,000 in a rolling year. So it doesn't have to be January to December. It can be, you know, November to October. Um, it just has to be a rolling year. If you exceed that $100,000, exempt or not, you should be nexus in that state. So then that leads me to the second most common question, what would I sell isn't taxable? Um, be careful there because that might not be true. Um, sometimes states are different. They might feel differently than your home state feels about it. So it might not be taxable in your home state, but it is going to be taxable in another state. And the, the big one that you normally hear often is the Twix bar dilemma. So Twix bars in some places, because it has a cookie in it, which uses flowers, makes it a bakery item, which makes it not taxable. But in other states, because of, I don't think it's the chocolate or something, I forget what it is, maybe the quantity of sugar, it is considered a candy and therefore it is taxable, right? So this is a very different feeling on this, right? Like why is this taxable in some and not in others? It's the same item. I've also seen it with like sunscreen or even dog treats because in the state of Texas, dog treats are exempt from tax. So kind of interesting, fun fact, right? Um, why dog treats? Who knows? All right. Um, this is just a slide to help you kind of with Nexus. How do you know if you are Nexus? One thing is you can kind of do it yourself, right? If you have all the Lara, by the way, which I you know it looks like Pam does, they actually do tell you if you've reached economic nexus in a state, as long as you report all of your transactions through all the Lara. So they'll give you a warning, but only a warning for the time period in which you were using all the Lara. So if you haven't used it for a full year, 
it's only going to calculate the ones that have exceeded it during that time. But tax chart is a good um, website to figure out some of these economic nexus laws. So is Avalara. If you are going to go to an outside CPA firm, make sure one is specialized to handle sales tax. A lot of them are not. So just because you're a CPA does not mean you know sales tax. So I recommend it to here. Pearsoner Johnson is a great one. And tax ops, um, there's Lady Judy. Those are two I recommend. And I recommend those also when we talk about tax group codes. They are some of the best in the business. And my apologies for anyone else who's really good about this. And they're like, what about me? Those are just two I know and I've personally worked with. And you can do Nexus studies as well. I know Avalara does have one. Um, I heard of somebody recently getting one by Deloitte. Price-wise, I don't know which is better. Um, honestly, most of the things to do with Nexus are just kind of expensive. I'm not going to lie. I think because it is so specialized, if you are good at it, you are probably charging more than others um, for that service. All right. So the Nexus Golden Rule. If you're going to take away one thing from this webinar today, I want it to be this. Never collect sales tax in a state and not remit it to the state. If you're under VDA with the state and you will be remitting tax, or you're like, hey, we're filing right now, um, but we don't have the license quite yet, but we will this month, but we're going to turn it on, you know, 11-1, but we might not have our license to 11-15. I'm okay with that because you're going to probably remit that tax. But if you're just like, oh, I turned on the state of in Colorado, and I'm never going to remit to them, and you just have this nice little slushy fund of sales tax sitting around, that is, in some states, a fourth degree felony. So don't go to jail, okay? And you're probably thinking to yourself, corporate veil, no corporate veil, if you are knowingly doing fraud, right? Um, you can kind of play ignorance if you got audited by the state, they'll just make you pay it back and with fines and interest and stuff like that. But if they know for some reason it was malice or that you intended to do this, or I don't know, I'm sure there's a threshold of when they'll pursue you or not pursue you, you can go to jail. Don't go to jail. Okay. Whew. Let's get into it. So we're going to hopefully set up some sales tax areas, jurisdictions, um, and tax details to like collect tax in the system and then generate the report so that you can get it. So realistically, the questions we're going to be asking yourself is who are we collecting tax for? So these are where are you nexus? And the key is where are you as a business? nexus at and that you are meant to collect and remit taxes and then what are the tax rates so you can normally kind of google this right which i'm meant to google this before we started um for a tax example but i did not for some reason i decided i would just freehand this um and just know that tax rates are super tricky and we will talk about this later on if you should integrate with an outside um, company like an Avalara, or if you should do this in BC. And one of the reasons behind that is because tax rates are difficult. Tax rates can be different on by based on the last four of a zip code because one side might put you in a county and the other side of that last four could put you in unincorporated, giving you a, like a two percentage variance between these two. It's a little easier if you have minimal businesses you're dealing with or minimal businesses that are tax rates or minimal states to do this inside of BC. Otherwise, it can get pretty cumbersome pretty fast to get these all set up. All right. And then the next question to ask is what customers are liable for tax? Um, hopefully, if we have time, we're going to talk about what makes a customer exempt from tax, like what documents you need. But generally speaking, if the person is using it for themselves, they are taxable. If the person is buying it then to resell it, they're normally not taxable, but they must prove to you they're taxable. And then finally, what items are taxable? And those that tax group code, kind of what we talked about with the Wix bar, right? It could vary state to state 
if it's taxable or not. Um, and then if it's service, it most likely is not taxable. So that's something you need to know when you're trying to set these up is what is taxable and what is not. So the first is going to be our tax jurisdiction setup. So I'm going to go through the slides and then we'll open up BC. So the tax jurisdiction setup, this is realistically where are we collecting tax and also which GL account are we going to pop these into? Now, one thing I do get asked a lot is about accounts. I see setups kind of differently um, based on different customers, where I might see that if somebody's setting up Idaho and Washington, they might have two GLs, one for Idaho, one for Washington. I typically don't recommend that setup. And the number one reason I don't recommend that setup is because if you're Nexus in 48 states, are you going to have 48 balance sheet accounts? That's going to suck. I would not do that. I would just have one for all of your sales tax. And then I normally see people put purchases or use tax in a secondary account and not the same account. Um, you can see here that this is a two tax rate where they have the Washington in one account. And then this next screenshot has Wash, um, Idaho, sorry, Idaho in one GL account. Oh, no, they don't. Am I blind? There was a different number. Oh, right there. There's a different number. I'm not crazy. Look at that. That must be a typo. I was like, why is that like that? So, um, and if you use something like Avalar, you can only have one GL account anyways. So I would just say you're better off one account to reconcile the one GL account and not have 48 GL accounts that you were trying to reconcile. There we go. Set the GL account where the tax liability will be posted, right? And the report to jurisdiction, it's just basically that. Where is it going to be reported to? In this case, it's the state of Washington. So you'll see here, it's King County, City of Yet, Seattle, and Washington, and they all have Washington. Now, have I seen this setup where it basically had Adams County here, Boise, there? Yes, you can do that. It's just for the reporting. It's a little bit easier if you lump things together that should be lumped. I don't know if I should the demo now. I'll just do the demo now because I feel like if I don't, I'm in trouble. You guys will be more lost if I don't, but let me get up some Denver tax rates because I honestly do not know. All right. Here we are. So we are going to set up our tax jurisdictions. And we're in just a chronos, so you'll see there's already some things in here. Um, but we are going to set up a new one. We're just going to pop in the state of Colorado. And the state of Colorado, um, well, actually, we're going to do the rate later. It already pulled in my sales tax accounts for me. Otherwise, I could have popped that in. And then we are going to do it in Colorado, right? That's pretty easy. And then we could do, this is Denver and the city of Denver. Same thing, Colorado, and then we're going to do Colorado Special. That is not how you spell Colorado. Okay, so that's all it is, right? That's tax jurisdictions. And this area is saying things can get a little out of control if you have a lot of places that you're in Nexus in, right? All right, I went too far. All right, so the next thing we're going to try to do is a tax area setup. And realistically, the tax area setup is just kind of pushing things together so that we have one code on a page that you can be assigned to customers, vendors, or locations. And then that's how it knows which one is together. And then you're probably asking yourself, can I just lump them all together and just had Denver? Yes. You could have. And while break it up, well, because maybe you don't just do business in the city of Denver, maybe you also do business in, I don't know, Littleton, right? And now you need Littleton, but you still need Colorado Special and you still need the state of Colorado. So therefore, you are going to want to have kind of those separation. So tax area, 
we're going to just do a new one called Denver, Colorado. Colorado is in the US. And we're going to pick up our Colorado, our Colorado special, and our Denver. Okay. Calculation order does not matter. You can put in whatever you feel like here, right? Like you do not have to put anything. Um, sometimes there are like years where maybe there is a tax you need to do before the other one. But in this case, it's just one rate. It's not a year situation. So we have our Denver in here and that is realistically all we need for this one. Um, and don't forget when you are applying for Nexus, it is where you are Nexus and that order is being shipped, right? So if the company you are, I don't know, New York company, Nexus in Colorado, and in addition to being Nexus in Colorado, you're dealing with a Wyoming company who's drop shipping to Denver, that is the Nexus triggering event. Ah, going too fast, okay. Um, so that, Tax area setup, that's what we just talked about. It's that grouping, it lists all the jurisdictions. So as I said before, if I had um, the Littleton, I would have had another one for Littleton in there. Um, so this is that sequencing that we don't really need. All right. Did I skip one? That's funny. I skipped the thing. I forgot to do the rates. I didn't even have slides for guys. All right. So the big thing is to, we have to get our rates in here, which maybe I meant to do that. That is back in tax jurisdiction. If you go into details on it, um, you can select the various tax group codes. So in most cases, I'm going to use furniture because I think that's going to be the best one in this one. Um, generally speaking, I will talk more about tax group codes here in a second. I don't know why this is out of order. And this is where you're going to put in those rates, right? So the Colorado rate itself is 2.9, right? So I am going to pop in the tax group code for the tax jurisdiction and what that effective rate date is, because they could have different effective rates per year, because annually these can change. So you might have several lines on here for several years. For right now, I'm just going to leave it with that effective of 12.6 and it's 2.9. And then I'm going to go into my other guys. I'm going to go to details. Same thing. I'm going to add that furniture. I'm just going to say it's 1.1.2023. And in Denver, the city tax for Denver is 4.8099. That went up this demo it used to be like three percent and now it's like almost five percent so that's pretty fun furniture one one twenty three and the rate is going to be 1.1 so now we have our combined rates so if we were to look at that combined rate it should equal 8.81 unless i did some mathing wrong which we won't care about math for now. We're just trying to set this up. So we got our tax jurisdiction in, and now we have our rates in as well. So we're going to look at customers. So these are going to be taxable by jurisdiction, um, if they're tax liable, tax area codes, things of that nature. So let's get back into Business Central, into my Kronos environment. We're gonna just pick up on this first customer here. All right, we're gonna look at a few of the fields. What fields here they are. All right, so you'll see here, this one's set up for Atlanta, Georgia. So the, the key fields we're looking for is tax liable, is true or false. Um, you're gonna see this even in Avalara. Um, this must be turned on to really trigger this customer for tax. And then the tax area code must be selected of which taxing group you are wanting them to be. Tax identification type, this is not really used in any tax things. 
And then there's this tax exemption number. So this tax exemption number should be their certificate number that excludes them from tax. But just a hot tip, this field is only on the customer card level. So if you are drop shipping, this is not on the drop ship cards. But this number will exempt all of their drop ship um, transactions as well. So if we were to look at a drop ship location, you'll see tax libels on it and tax area code is on it, right? So now I can select my Denver, but you're not seeing the exemption. So I know this is Atlanta and it was Georgia on the customer card, but let's just pretend for a second. It's a full other address. It's in Colorado. Um, then this transaction would be exempted as well because the customer card has something on it. And if you are using an outside software, as simple as a space in this field could exempt this transaction from sales tax, right? Because this is an override to this, right? So you might say, yeah, it's Georgia tax, it's tax liable, but I have something here and that is now going to exempt this transaction from tax. So be careful with that, especially if you are using an outside service and you have like a CERT Capture ECM Pro, you do not want these fields filled in. Um, that you don't, nothing, just completely blank. So that is the customer card. That's how you're going to fill out that customer card. You're going to pick that tax area and that tax liable code that you want on that card. All right. Now we're going to talk about IM cards. And this is where, before we were talking about those tax group codes and setting up those together. So I normally use the tax posting groups to help me identify the tax group codes, right? So you can have different ones. You'll see in here we have non-tax and taxable. Um, if you are using an outside service, these normally need to say NT and taxable and not no tax and tax. So these are kind of funny ones, right? But if you're on the item card, it's just right there. That's the tax group code, and you're going to fill it in. Now, here's some hot tips. Okay. So you normally do want the word taxable or NT. Um, I do have a few customers, ah, I was trying to highlight it, that use this ON code for NT because sometimes with Avalara, there's problems with the NT on credit memos. So I have some people that use this ON code. You can use words like non-taxable as well. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't actually always translate into Avalara as non-taxable. Um, you can also use sometimes, especially if you have sometimes taxable products, tax group codes that are meant for your product, right? So that's what I was saying about those dog treats. If you are using Avalara and you are using the wrong tax group code and you don't have you're just using taxable. Taxable means highest tax everywhere, right? But those dog treats are not taxable in the state of Texas, which means I need to use a real tax group code to exempt them. Will this work in BC and NAV? Absolutely not, right? Does PF1000 mean a single thing to your BC setup? No, not unless you told it to mean something. But even then, BC setups are just not going to do a good job for you on those sometimes taxable products because what you configure is what you get. Um, so just be careful there. I will also tell you if you are implementing something like an Avalara, those tax group codes can be what like delays your project. And if you're like, Andrea, can't you help me with my tax group code? The answer is no, I'm not going to. I don't want you to sue me if I select the wrong one. Um, those two of companies I listed earlier, Tax Off and um, Pilsner Johnson, they do do that for a living. They do look up tax group codes and can help you with those tax group codes. You can look them up yourself. Um, but those I have seen delay most of my tax projects is that people not using um, the proper codes. Now you're thinking, well, can't I just make it taxable? Taxable everywhere. Who cares about my dog treats in the state of Texas? Technically charging for over um, sales tax can lead to civil penalties, right? So not only is it just kind of bad customer service, especially if people in Texas know they shouldn't be charging for those dog biscuits, 
taxes, they could technically um, sue you. But um, there is a bigger issue if you just keep the money, right? So if you're doing your returns and for some reason you know that like you collected money on dog treats and you didn't give it to the state of Texas, they are going to be pretty mad at you. That was my hot tip there, right? All right. Tax detail setups. All right. So we looked at item cards. We just looked at on the screen, but we are going to look really quick at the item card here because mostly because I selected the word furniture so that means I need this to say furniture or it's just not going to work out for me it does yay so tactic code should say furniture and it does my next example is going to work out for me then love it when a plan comes together all right that leads us to the tax detail setup. That's, I put that in a weird order. I'm not sure I like that I did that. So the tax detail setup, we were technically were in this screen earlier. This is where you're putting in those tax rates, right? So this is where it all comes together. For some reason earlier, I thought, did I just mess this step up? No, I just put it in an awkward order. Probably should have put this sooner. Um, so that talks about those effective dates, when the rate is started, those rates can change. Um, and is, is that tax below um, the maximum? That was the minimum. That's a weird name, right? Like tax below maximum. I've actually skipped this step entirely before, which is funny enough because these wordings don't make any sense. So I'm like, what is that? What does that mean? What well, means that is where you are trying to charge tax for. Um, so, Pick that one. When we get the use tax, we'll typically use different words than like furniture. We're going to use words like supplies. Um, so it's kind of that combination. If you were using the words like taxable, see how this has non-taxable. But if I had taxable, I would expect to see Colorado and taxable and then taxable on those item cards. In this scenario, we have the lovely word furniture. So that's what I was saying. Like if you were setting up Texas, for dog treats and you have the code and you have the code here for dog treat, you would have $0 tax on that, uh, that dog treats. Um, so it does get pretty complicated if you're just using in system. Okay. I'm really running out of time. So I don't know if I'm gonna switch to too many more demos. And this is the demo. We kind of did it while we were there, but realistically, what you're trying to do is that tax jurisdiction, which does contain a tax detail setup screen where you can do your rates. So who and for how much? Your tax areas, the combining of those groups. Oh, and I have something in there for purchases and payable, so that's fun. Um, and then that tax group codes. This should have been the customer card one, not purchases and payable set. All right. Ooh, that was a lot, guys. This question, oh, I just realized I didn't, you're not going to pop up the question. Where must you collect sales tax? And so I'll accept anything on this. I originally wrote out like a few questions and then they kind of read like Schrodinger's cat. So for your CPE credit, where must you collect sales tax? And you don't actually have to be specific. You don't have to say words like in New York. So it's either you can do your options can be one, where you're shipping it to that you are nexus. So you matter like Schrodinger's cat, right? Second, where you're shipping it and they are nexus, so your customer's nexus there. Or finally, where you and them are nexus and you're shipping it. Or it could just be everywhere. Get that bread, Uncle Sam. Yeah. I like it, Pam. I'll accept it. In a state, you have a certain number of sales. Okay, moving on. We got like 10 minutes. We're going to talk about using it. And if you guys watch TikToks, there's this like the more you know thing where it has like all the questions and stuff and the like song. And so that's what that's from. But if you don't watch TikToks at all, um, that's just creepy. So you're welcome. All right. So we're probably not going to do the demo on the sales orders just because we don't have a lot of time on I mean, 
No, I got time. I think I got time. I'm just trying to, yeah, I don't, I don't have a slide for this, so I actually do have to open this. Okay. We are going to make a quick sales order because I just want you to see it all come together. Otherwise, it's all for naught. It's all for naught. Fast. All right, let's pick an item. We're going to pick the desk because the desk I know is turned on correctly. There is some weird stuff in here. If you're like, what are these weird builds? Um, there is some dev work in this. So that is what you were looking at. All right. Since we had it turned on on the customer card, the in key elements is going to be this tax libel is on. The tax area code is, in this case, Atlanta, which is not a big deal because we're just trying to get some tax on here. And then we can see up here the tax area code is on this line, and the tax group code is furniture. Look, and it already put the tax in for me, right? So this is what we are expecting, that we have this amount excluding tax, the tax applied, and then the total including tax. So it already did it for me. If you are using Avalara, you have to have what we call a triggering event where you release the order, you hit statistics, you have to do something to get the tax here. It normally just doesn't populate like we saw here. So that is the, and we're just gonna ship an invoice this one, hope not to hit a bunch of errors because it's a demo environment with some dev in it. All right, so post it. We're just going to check it out really quickly. And we can see it has its tax. If we were to print this, it should have tax on it. I actually hit print instead of preview. That was fun. Okay. All roads lead to Rome. There we go. So it has a tax and it says amount subject to sales tax. And there we have it. We have tax on our invoice. And if we wanted to do then a report, there is a sales tax collected report. So if I am now trying to remit tax, I'm trying to find my sales, this is where I would go. Now I did do this into Georgia, not into my newly created, this is um, Colorado. So I am just gonna pull out for today's date range, just so we can see it, because I did put it as today's. So you'll see it's going to take me through all of the jurisdictions and it's saying zero because I had none. What happened? Oh, and don't mind my year. Apparently this is still set up for 2022. Now, there we go. So now we can see the cell. It does break it out. I find this to be a little confusing because you have like think Georgia is 1,000, this 1,000. So if I was to total all this together, it's going to say 3,000. That's not correct. The total tax is correct. But if you are actually trying to like just obtain what was the sales amount, that's a little inconvenient. There are different reports. This is just the most standard one um, that, because you do, sometimes you do, especially for like Colorado, you do need to break it out by city and by county and all different kinds of things. Or if you're in Louisiana, another really fun one, um, or Arizona, you do have to split it out pretty heavily when you go to report it. So that's why it's doing it like that. It just looks a little funky if you only have to report the 1000 to Georgia and then the $60. So that is the report. Now this next section, this is where I'm gonna to talk to you for fast. This is the bonus section, but I want to go through the bonus section. All right, so BC Build 10. I've kind of discussed a little bit pro cons here. Um, the pro is it's already there and it's pretty easy to set up, right? Um, there's really no integration time or cost or it's pretty limited and pretty much it's the easiest option, but it's the easiest option for limited States and customers, right? Right, follow me down that path. Um, con, that doesn't really help you with any Cypress certificate management. Um, it, the drop ship can be weary, right? Like if you got somebody drop shipping to 40 states, one certificate, and they're not actually exempt in other states, you could have a problem on your hands. You have to do each state by itself, right? Like you have to 
upload a bunch of stuff into the system and it could be very error prone, especially since tax rates do change, right? Because now you are in charge of this tax system. Um, so somebody has to update these. Um, and it's not going to really help you with your online or your marketplaces, right? So it's not one system that's going to help you with Amazon or those Facebook reporting, or if you sell on Shopify um, and you're doing the tax on Shopify or Magento. All right, so the pros of an outside system. So if you are gonna go with somebody like Avalar or TaxJar or Vertex, um, they manage all the tax rates, All right, So that's nice. Um, some of them do have certificate management systems. So if you are worried about your certificates, then this is who is going to help you with those as well. Um, some of them do do filings for you as well. So you don't have to worry about a changeover in people and now you have a problem. I recently had a customer just not remitting their filings to California anymore, not because they didn't want to remit them to the state of California, because they didn't know they were in nexus there. So they were collecting tax and not remitting it um, and they had like all these notices that they weren't doing tax because the person who was doing it left and left poor notes for them. Um, and you can normally attach these to your websites and marketplaces. They work with Shopify, the Magento, Amazon's the Meta, right? They work with everybody so you can attach it. But the cons, they're expensive. Um, there is normally integrations. If you are going to integrate it with it, come to me. Don't go to them. I can integrate it faster and cheaper. Um, and this is the same as BC. What you configure is what you get. So if you set it up poorly, I have bad news. It's going to work poorly, right? Um, it doesn't just magically work um, if you set it up not in your favor. If you don't use tax codes and now you're trying to figure out, well, but it's hacked my dog biscuits. It, that's why I taxed your dog biscuits, right? And of course, it's a whole new system. It's something else you must learn. All right, so tax exemption documents. I don't have a lot of time to cover this. So if you are going to exempt somebody from tax, get a certificate, right? Do not just take their word for it. Like, of course, they're a big business. They've been in business for 50 years and they are reselling it. No, you get a certificate. No certificate, you tax them, right? Um, Because you can refund them if they provide one for you, or you can, um, they can get it back from the state, right? So if you're like, no, nah, I'm not going to deal with this, you're going to deal with this, they can get it back from the state themselves. Um, so the different types of tax exemption documents, some are going to be state issued, like the state of Florida here, which is not going to be specific to you, but it is an annual, so that sucks, right? Thanks, Florida, for that. Um, the other ones with state specific forms like New Jersey here, it has the ST3. Um, so these are required by that state. These must be addressed to you, right? Like that is your name that goes there. So I don't know who's on the phone, but if this was a certificate for me and you're issuing this for me, that better be say Anovia Consulting on here. And that better be our address. Otherwise this is not a valid certificate, right? Another one is my favorite, the multi-jurisdictional form. This one is actually a loan. No, though, this, this form might still be good. This might be an old one. Sometimes I don't update my screenshots. Once again, this must be addressed to you. This must have been issued to you. And the dates matter because these certificates don't just stay good forever. I think in California, they do. But in the state of Colorado, it is five years. Other states are three years. You saw the Florida was the one year. So let's make sure these are all like, done well because at the end of the day if the tax man for california knocks on your door and says prove to me that these cells are tax exempt these have to be right because guess who owes the state of california the money the interest the penalties if your customer is not exempt from tax it's you you owe the money right so don't owe california money that is not your money. So don't make any assumptions about somebody's tax exemptions. Make them prove it. And I will tell you, you will get a lot of resistance because not everybody is educated in sales tax. So for them, you are speaking Greek. You are asking them for something that nobody's ever asked them before. And they're going to say, 
that like, well, can't we just handshake on it? I'm good for it, bro. They're not good for it, bro. Don't trust them. Okay. Get the certificate. And then there is Suda and Suda has recently updated to encompass more. And basically what the Suda states allow is for you to be tax exempt in the state that you're drop shipping to, that they're not actually registered in. So the other ones basically require them to be registered in. So if they're going to drop ship into a state that they are nexus in, they can have that tax exemption. But what if they drop state into drop ship into a state they're not nexus in? Now you have to charge them tax. They have no exemption certificate. So that's where SUDA comes in. They don't actually have to be registered in it. Um, they can just have the SUDA form and it allows them exemption from their home state into this state. Um, and there are some others, right? Uh, so that Florida story told you we got out of it because we were shipping it to Mexico. So um, you can have like live, like proof that the goods left the states and stuff like that, or a drop shippers user exemption forms, but just be careful with those. All right, my last question for CPE, and I know we have like one minute. <laughs> What do you do if somebody says you're tax exempt but doesn't give you an exemption certificate? Charge and tax. Excellent. Excellent, Pam. That was right. <laughs> All right. I made it with no time to spare, but I can stay on if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Anne.